please note that this video contains spoilers. Put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast, so while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. Street Kings movie thoughts. I quite like the entire introduction to Tom, where at first you don't really know quite what's going on. I suppose you can't even be completely sure, although you've probably had your suspicions, that he is a cop until he tells the twins when he finds them in the cage. Yeah, it, it, there's a pretty big hint like just before that with the rubber glove and, you know, that, that whole thing, but that's the first time you really get complete confirmation on that, and sort of just the very first thing, you know, the, it starts with the black screen and you hear the alarm buzzing and he wakes up, reluctantly gets up, he throws up, just, you don't, you don't know much at all about this man, but you know that, as David Iyer puts it on the commentary track, whatever he did last night, you know, it, it wasn't good for him. It, it was, yeah, it, it messed him up. And he goes and gets the vodka and drinks and then goes out and, you know, does the exchange thing with the machine gun. And, you know, you still don't know exactly what's going on. And then once he rolls out of the way of the car and then makes a phone call, you get the sense that he planned the entire exchange you know, with the racist comments and and then he is getting you know getting to back his car and getting the the gun and vest from the trunk which they left entirely intact and yes you know moments after he's shot the others you know, even the guy on the bathroom, that's, you know, that's like a law use, it's like shooting someone in church. And he, you know, frees the twins, sets it up so that it looks like he, he was fired upon by the ones that he gunned down, and you, you understand that he is a dirty cop. And then at the same time, you do, there, there's that nice, sort of duality of it that clearly he's a dirty cop and he killed two guys who were defenseless but at the same time he saved these two young girls so you know at, at that point we're like 10 minutes into the film and there's plenty of moral gray it you, you can't just say which well, he shouldn't have done that but he got results and at the same time you know there there's arguments against it as well because at the same time he did end up you know killing these like Washington brings up just a couple of minutes later they may have been monsters but they deserved a trial and yeah, just this whole thing, it, it does a really great job, I feel, and then that moves nicely into the introduction to Wander, the father figure of, as, as I say in the review, that the, you know, the, the sort of mentality is uh, in, in the vice squad, the locker room mentality, and it's that, indeed, it's David Iyer on the commentary track as well who puts it that way, and Wander is clearly the father of them all, and they all want his attention, and Tom gets it because he is, he, he gets the job done, he, he gets sent on these little missions, and he gets the job done very dependably, he just, Wander just has to also 
you know, keep an eye on him. And this is the the thematic is much subtler than in Harsh Times. I'm not going to be giving any spoilers for Harsh Times in this video, where the the, the idea that Wander needs to keep Tom from messing up is communicated nicely and set up very early because Wander points out, you know, what are you avoiding? He can Im immediately tell that something's wrong. You know, he's like, are, are you okay? Yeah, I got shot. But you're okay, right? It's, he's like, that's not it. That's not what's wrong. I can tell. And he notices the, the vodka and he says that thing about the, you, can't, you can't smell vodka on your breath. It ain't true. And, you know, instead of saying, well, crap, we just, we can't do anything about it, he just said, oh, we'll, we'll get you to the hospital, we'll claim that your injuries are worse than they actually are, and then the, you know, that way it won't be clear that you were drunk while, you know, he, he has two of these little airplane bottles of vodka before the the others show up, so, uh, you know, at least two, so clearly, yeah, and, and you also get, kind of get the sense that it's what he needs to do what he does, he, he has to drink up the courage to, maybe, and he, he knows he's going to take a beating from those two Koreans, and, you know, he knows he might get shot at, and he still has to go in there and do it. And, and going alone into this room where he knows there are at least two guys and there could be more. And, you know, they probably have guns they had last time. Now, the... But, but yeah, the, the Wander as being the father figure who's all, always looking out for Tom is communicating nicely, set up very early, and consistent throughout and excuse me it it makes excuse me it makes sense when you find out that he is you know that the entire vice squad is dirty except for, you know well Tom is dirty as well but he's not as dirty you could say or he's dirty for the right reasons which again brings in the moral gray is it okay to be corrupt for the right reasons, does that make it okay? But yeah, the, the entire Vice Squad is just, you know, they're, they're covering up all this stuff and, and getting money for the cookie jar for war, water, and he's collecting power, he's stockpiling evidence against the various ones so that he can always make the allegations disappear and the like and you know that like he says to Tom and this is how how Tom has been able to touch the untouchables and so on and so forth and I feel like it's it's a good twist in that you don't see it coming I did not figure it out at all when I first watched it, but when you hear it, you believe it. You know, you you, you believe that he he's definitely smart enough to do it, and it just it just it works. And that the that the vice squad is as well. You don't realize until he's in the car cuffed. And they start talking about how they're gonna mess up Linda Washington, and uh, you know his what's his nurse girlfriend. I think they were also gonna hit and uh, all this stuff. And yeah, and and this right after the nice misdirection of you think that he's Tom's gonna be staying with her, and that you know because he can't go out there. They're all the cops are looking for him, but then suddenly they bust down the door and. And it makes sense because they know where he is. They know that that is one of the places he could be. And 
this whole thing of you, you haven't put pieced together that it's the Vice Squad, you just know that it's, you know, someone knows something. How did they know already that it's, it's on the news? I just left them and it's already on the news that they were, you know, detectives. And the thing about walking, talking, exigent circumstances, which also set up nicely when, it's, it's said only one other time in the movie, I'm pretty sure, when Tom is, you know, explaining what, how it went down at the Koreans' place, there were exigent circumstances. I heard screams from the house. And, and the thing about that, that Wander says about how they were so deep undercover they lost their minds. And that also really says something. And, and there's also that line about, are all the cops out for themselves? You know, is, is any cop here straight? Is, is, and it, it says something about it because after a while, going at it standard, in, in the standard manner, the criminals know what the cops are going to do, so they have to get some men undercover, and, these, and, and the cops have to use certain methods, and all this, and after a while it does get to be so muddled, and yeah, after a while, you know, there are people who've gone undercover and who basically forgot that they weren't always in this environment, that, that disappear into their roles, and it's, it's a scary thing, and I, I think it does a really good job of that, and ultimately in the film, the worst are the, or several of the worst characters are all cops. And without it being some kind of, you know, it's not, it's not against cops, because Tom is very much, he's an anti-hero, but everyone in the film has some grey in them. There's, there's no real innocent character in this. But Tom is kind of the solution suggested by the film, very much that he is necessary, as he tells Hugh Laurie, James, and Biggs, I think is the character, last name, and as he repeats back to him at the end of the film, they, they need someone who is willing to go beyond the law and who is still willing to do, to uphold the law, to, to be dirty for the right reason. And Wander is also very much the sort of the the clear the yeah someone someone who's corrupt for the wrong reason. He just wants power, and at the same time you, you get why you know he says it, he's fixing a flaw in the system. He's looking out for his own kind by gathering all this money and by trying to make it easier and better and protecting his own. Now, I really like that Tom doesn't, you know, he, he doesn't get reformed over the course of it. He is not taught that he has to be clean. Uh, ultimately, it works out for him to be dirty for the right reason. There is no... But because, yeah, again, they, they need him, they need someone like him to, to do what he does, and I just feel like it would really betray the rest of the film, the, the, and, and the entire subgenre of neo-noir, if he was to find out that he had to become, you know, a an honest cop again, or, or if Linda Washington hadn't gone, you know, I've already packed, you know, the, he knew and she knew that she was going to have to get away from there in order to stay safe. And the, I also, 
also feel like they, they do a good job of keeping Tom very... You, you, he has her sympathy. You know, he, he tries to make it okay with Linda Washington and he, try, you know, he ends up giving her the disc with the footage on it so she knows what happened. And yeah, he's, he's clearly fighting for the right cause and that's also why Biggs knew that it was going to, you know, that there was no other outcome once he got put on the track, once he looked towards that, he was going to find out. Because he's a good cop, he's a smart cop. He's not, not good in the kind of not corrupt, but he's skillful as a detective. He can figure out what's really going on. And he is he has too much of a moral center, a creamy, in case you were wondering, to not go after Wander, even though he has depended on him for so long. And that's also why at the end, he has to depend on someone else, and it's from now on it's going to be Biggs. Or at least that, that one time it will be Biggs. The entire third act, as, as I say in the main review, is just all kinds of awesome. From right when they dig up the real Fremont Coates, you just know something is going to, you know, there's... <laughs> that was the last thing you expect to find at the end of this maze, you know, the, the, you, you have different theories, maybe, but you did not expect that the real guys were dead and that, that you know, and it makes sense to frame dead guys because, that, you know, it's literally a dead end. It, they can't actually, you know, you can't solve the case if the, the suspects are dead. And that's why they make sure to plant DNA evidence, because DNA evidence is, you know, you, that, that means that those are the suspects we're pursuing, and then when they actually are dead, no one's going to find them, basically. And then they go on and find the, the people who have been using the, you know, the names of Fremont Coates. And, you know, the, the, just the whole process, they, they get that one guy beat him up with a phone book, phone book Tom, and, and the thing about, aren't you supposed to ask questions? This is perfect because it's just this kind of thing, he knows that he's not going to get answers, so he just goes straight to the phone book, and he's just, you, you really see that he's been doing this for so long, for 17 years. And, you know, he knows that, yeah, he, he knows some people in a high security prison who have a way of getting in contact with Fremont Coates. And okay, he, they book him, he gets into contact with them, calls back, gives them the name of Scribble, you know, Cedric the Entertainer. They go back out and get Cedric, you know, Scribble, and First he takes them up to where they find the buried real Fremont codes and the find with the, the teeth, you know, the, the gold teeth, the row of gold teeth. And then they go and and you know, Cedric's called by them and he arranges the meeting and it's that very evening and they both go there, you know, the, the car ride. So, what, we're just gonna go to them and kill them? No, we're gonna ask them some questions. Then we're gonna kill them. And they get in, and they're, these guys are clearly paranoid. They've got weapon trained on, you know, who are these guys? Scribble. They're cool, man. They just chill. And, you know, it gradually, it, 
it gets closer and closer, and, and it gets worse and worse. And suddenly, one of them says, this is Tom Lolo, isn't it? I recognize you from this, the, the, what was it? Um, 7-Eleven, let's go with that. And the other one recognizes him as well, and then suddenly Dis Discant recognizes them, and he gets shot in the frickin' throat. And Ludlow's behind the couch, and they try to get Scribble to shoot him, but he just, he, he's not gonna shoot. So he, he doesn't want to, that, that's just not him. And that's where the, the character is very, very consistent, and even though he is a criminal, he's not just, you know, there, there's, you, you can kind of understand who he is. You, you get the sense from right away that he, he doesn't really like this whole, you know, he, he doesn't really want to be involved in murders and such. He, he's happy giving up Fremont and Coates. And he keeps warning Ludlow and Disco, these guys are just monsters. And he gets shot for not, you know, going along and, and shooting Ludlow. And Ludlow, let's see, they, the one guy runs out of ammo. And Ludlow shoots out both television sets and then the one light in the room. And now there's no light left in the room. And he turns on the flashlight. Because now he can see, but the guy, when he lights him in the face, is going to be blinded, and that's going to throw him off, and he shoots him. And then the other one shoots with the shotgun, and he gets behind the... Lolo gets behind the fridge, and I can't imagine that a fridge could slow down shotgun slugs enough. You know, both sides of the fridge have to go through, and he shoves it over to him, and he reaches over and shoots him, and again, what's the other guy going to do? And he's standing there with a the shotgun, which is getting pressed up against him because the fridge is in the way, you know, that whole thing, just, it makes good sense. He's making these very quick tactical decisions that you can follow, you can understand what he's trying to do, and then... You have the, you know, he gets taken in by the, you know, Amore in Alaska and John Corbett, and they're talking about all the bad stuff they're going to do, and he, he gets the spare key for cuffs, and he unlocks his cuffs, and then he gets the, the know, arm of, of the cuff, into the cheek of Corbett, who's driving the car and just yanks him back. And they're fighting, and the, the car is going fast, and there's cars all around them, and just the whole thing. And they eventually t smack him and subdue him. And then he wakes up, and, you know, Corbett is just gonna have a little fun, sh shoots at him, and, and Amari in Alaska shoots at him. And Corbett gets the, you know, it goes over to finish him off, and Lolo crawls all the way over, gets the shovel, whacks him on the head, and then he gets Corbett's gun and shoots Molasco. And then, you know, Clay J. Moore is like trying to find the DVD because without that, it makes sense. It makes sense that he hasn't done anything to Linda yet because. First and foremost, the DVD. If if they don't get the DVD, then the evidence is still out there. And he doesn't think that anyone's coming for him, you know. And that the longer she's awake and alive, maybe she might eventually talk about what the DVD is. Maybe he can intimidate her, and he busts in and grabs it and ends the trunk with him. And then the whole scene with water and their brief but really cool fight. And, and it's, I like that it's the first time you see Wander get physical, really, in, in any kind of, you know, he, he has a presence, but, yeah, you, ha you haven't seen him use any kind of physical prowess as a, and it makes sense that he 
has that because he he is a cop. So obviously he you know at at some point he definitely had that in him and yeah given that he you know, he lives in this very ruthless world so obviously he wants to keep that up so he can defend himself although he does apparently also live in a house with no family or kids around because Tom goes to his house several times and there's never anyone waking up and coming in daddy who is that man so yeah I, I don't know I'm pretty sure he mentions a family at some point, or maybe I'm just thinking of Panic Room, where his every other line is, I have a family. But yeah, that, that did kind of one, you know, he's, he's, go, he's there at the party, when the nurse is also there, Grace. He's there, you know, at 4 a.m. in the morning, talking about his wife, and he's there then at the end, you know. I I suppose I could talk a little bit about the some of the deleted stuff. The originally it was gonna turn out that Wander was the one who had been sleeping with Tom's wife and who, as we are told, left her to die alone in front of a hospital. And I don't personally feel like this was a big loss that it was cut. I don't feel like it really needed to be a sort of personal vendetta for Tom. It's, I suppose you could say that he's getting revenge, excuse me, for Washington, but really he's also fighting for what's right. And his wife, his wife's death was tragic, but like that, you know, that coroner says, you know, I don't investigate adultery. And really, she was just cheating on Tom, basically. And it would just be a little too much just machismo and nothing really, you know, it's, it's a horrible way to die for her. But it's just... I, I don't feel like it was really necessary. I feel like it makes it maybe too much of a personal thing. And it was very much that, you know, it, it was harder for Tom to do because it was personal, because he actually cared about Wander. But at the end of the day, he was, you know, doing the right thing. It was... You know, one thing was that he was getting revenge for his old partner, but he already killed the two guys who shot him. So, I just feel like it's more that he's doing the right thing than him getting, him, him settling some personal score. I suppose that might more or less cover it. I, I like the way, throughout the film, Wander and Biggs seem like they're very decidedly, you know, for Tom or against Tom, respectively. And at the end of the day, it turns out that it's the exact opposite, you know, and, and Wander isn't protecting Tom when he busts into Biggs' office and, you know, f full of bravado and if you, you have a problem with my man, you come to me! That's him protecting himself. That's because he knows that Tom might mess up. It's, and, and the, the two, you know, Biggs and, and Wander are really fighting over who Tom will help. It's, it's not about whether Tom is going to, you know, rat out anyone. It's about getting, if, if, Wander might not really know what Biggs is up to. He just knows that 
you know, he knows that he's bad news. He knows that Biggs is out to get him. And he's, he's, he's a direct man. I, I love when he, he doesn't just tell him, I wish you would just shoot your head off. He says, why don't you do the force a favor and wash your mouth out? Buckshot. It's just such a... I, I just love the way he puts that. Wash your mouth out with buckshot. It's nice and specific too. I, I don't want any part of your head left once you've committed suicide, is what I'm saying. And I guess that pretty much covers it. Jay Moore is great at playing a jerk, and in this, I feel like he does... The man is good at making you hate him, but in this, you don't hate him until you find out what a bastard he is at the end when he's threatening Linda Washington. I mean, when he's, you know, shredding the documents of you know, the Fremont and Coates papers, you don't think that much of it. And, yeah, just these various things. And I love when, when Tom asks him if, when, when Tom asks Wander if Jay Moore, if Clady gave him a happy ending. <laughs> because he looks so happy. There's got to be something like that. And, and Clady stopping Tom. I'm just going to go talk to him. No, you're not. You know, it's just that whole... And I suppose that pretty much covers it. Yes. Please rate and comment. And hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.